blankets. There are blankets in there. And as soon as the class is over next door, we'll bring in more cushions. But don't be shy about getting up and finding whatever you need to be comfortable. out this chant today um, because I met this woman a couple of weeks ago. Her name was Lara and she's kind of like, she looks like around the age of a lot of us in the room and she was so bright and glowing and lovely and smiling and practicing yogi and just loving being smart and talented and friendly. And I just found out um, a few days ago that she was hit by a car and she died. Wow. And I was like, Exactly that. I was like, whoa, like, whoa, like this person who looks, her love was so bright, like she's in the prime of her life. And I know we hear it like in the teachings, our life, we don't know when it's going to be gone, like it can be gone in a second. Mm -hmm. Like, like death doesn't discriminate if you're an older person or a younger person or a little child or an infant. And sometimes it's so hard because we think, no, I, you know, when I'm, 80, I've like got like a lifetime plan of goals of what I'd like to achieve. Like By the time I'm 80, I'd like this to be set up and be here, but I don't know. I don't know that I'm going to, to make it. Like I might. I might. I could possibly die, you know. Today or tonight could be some weird aneurysm or something, but we're not used to living thinking that's really going to happen to us. Like, I don't think that's going to happen to me. Like, I feel fine. I don't think that. But in the last few months, I keep hearing these stories about people who have close friends who have a, a cancer that 
took them out and I found out one day they're going into hospice and it's like a 40 year old mom with two young kids and awesome, creative and vibrant and loving and amazing relationship with her husband. I mean, a person who does everything for her friends and community. And, and she was going into hospice. One, I didn't know she was going to hospice. And I was like, oh gosh, I've got to write her a letter, like how much she means to me. And the next day, I, um, I couldn't come up with the words, which was so strange because she was so, um, she meant so much to me, her, her example in the world. And, and it turned out that the next day I found out she died. She died the day before. Again, she was gone. Like she went to hospital, she was gone. I thought she maybe six months or something. And I just, that one was such a hard death for me to take because, I mean, my, my, I've had a lot of deaths already happen, close ones. But that one, because she was so close in my age and so vibrant, like it was so much harder for me to even take, well, my grandmother was a hard death, my father was a hard death. But that one was so like, why, why does someone have to go before their time? They haven't finished, like for me, they haven't finished all they're capable of. They were so capable of giving so much. Um, and, and I had to really struggle with it. And I do all these teachings on death and practices, how to work through a death process. And I thought I had a good grasp on it, but it was so hard, like I was grieving so hard because I didn't, I still didn't get it. I'm like, I'm still like, well, what is it supposed to mean? And like, what am I gonna get from this example? And what they ended up giving me was, you have a chance now, we all do in this room, to, um, to put this practices, this, what Lizette's teaching us about stillness, getting that platform of being able to sit, hold your mind on a particular object, it's a really valuable thing to spend your time on. Not in and of itself, it's useful to reach all your goals. But if we can get, once you get that, you can hold this object that she's been talking about, um, emptiness, the way things exist in an ultimate way, the way we're not used to looking at things. Uh, we're not used to thinking um, this glass is ever not going to be a glass, that it wasn't always a glass. Um, it could crack and break and it won't be there anymore. We don't see that when we look at it. You think, no, it's a glass, always a glass to everybody. And it's not the case. And when you meditate, you can slow things down so much and have a, a experience of a reality beyond the one that we're used to seeing. And that reality, it fits the word exactly, extraordinary. Like it's so, feels so real, feels so natural. Um, but it's, but there's, there's so much more to it. There's no time, the love, the, the completeness that you feel. It's like, oh, I don't have to want for anything. I don't have to struggle. I don't need a partner. I don't need uh, this much money. I, you don't need anything. You feel so full. And that's at our essence. And when we begin to have experiences like that, you have so much more to give. You're living so fully in a moment. You're not chasing things or feeling incomplete. You know you're complete. And it's just a different experience of life. And the thing is that human beings, they don't, we're the ones who have the opportunity to experience it. The animals don't, the ants, and if you think about how many bugs there are in the world and how many humans are, they really outnumber us, the animals and those realms of beings that we're familiar with. It's the human body and mind and conditions that give us a really rare chance to, to practice, to, to be able to do these things, to want to do them, to have teachings on them. We're like set up perfectly, like we care about it. We, we, we're all here tonight because we want to know how to do it. And it's available to all of us, but I won't kid you that it takes effort, that you have to sit and like work at it every day. It does need your effort. And sometimes it's not fun when you learn something new. It's like, I don't want to do my scales. You know, oh, I don't want, I love the piano, but I don't want to do my scales. 
But once you do master them, you can play this incredible music and fix people and move them. And if you're willing to sit and, and try really hard, we're here for you. If you want more instructions and coaching on how to, like what's not working for you, but there is something that's available to you that will change your life. And give it, you, you almost laugh after. It's like that thing, the Zen story about cutting wood, like before enlightenment, cutting wood, after enlightenment, cutting wood. You still do the same things, but your experience is very different. Anyway, thanks for listening. I just, okay, so worked. It means so much to us to be able to have people who want to go for it, you know, like, and we'll go for it because you can get it. And it will take you time, but it's worth it. It's really worth it. So I picked um, a little chant. We can sing it a little bit. And it's from the Diamond Cutter. It's about um, the impermanence of things, like a cloud or lightning or a star. They come into being and they go out. They're just here for an instant. We, too, are just here for an instant. But that instant, it's so the opportunity we have with this instant of ours. Um, I fully believe what we're doing right now in this room over after is the most worthwhile thing anybody could do with their life. You won't be sorry. I need, I need to try and sing now. Please sing after and uh, open your hearts. Just wish it for everybody. Like, I'm doing this for you all, you know, everyone you love, everyone you knew who went, everyone who ever affected you or mattered to you, or all those people you know hurt like we hurt, all the stupid things people do in the war, or in the <coughs> world with war and things. If we could just sing happily, like, we have the answer, it's like a joyful thing. It's like, not, oh yeah, it's kind of the bittersweet, like, oh God, we're suffering. But there's also a joy, there is a joy there, um, wrapped up. You just kind of got to find it, got to go after it. So, here I try. I'll do three ohms, it can warm our voices up a little. Oh. Yeah.
anything brought about by causes as like a star, an obstruction of the eye, a lamp, an illusion, the dew, or a bubble, a dream, or lightning, or else a cloud. for venturing out tonight, um, even in the rain. <laughs> it's rather soggy out, um, so I super appreciate you tonight. Um, thank you, Coco. Um, it's so funny. Today, you know, I, I was preparing for tonight, and um, it occurred to me, like, some new people would be coming tonight. And, and tonight's a really hard class, <laughs> actually. And I'm like, oh no, you know, do I actually give the class I thought I was going to give? Should I give something totally different? And I had to really think about it and pray about it and, um, and just come up maybe with a different way to present it um, rather than a whole new uh, class because it's an important class. Um, so what Coco sang is actually really, really important for today's topic because uh, it's all about emptiness. It's all about uh, things not existing the way we think they exist, the way we're so certain they exist that we keep like knocking our heads against the same wall <laughs> over and over and over, wondering why does it have to hurt, you know? And um, it doesn't. It doesn't, you know? And, and so tonight's class about is about that, is about being, seeing things uh, for what they are or are not, or couldn't be, uh, including your own life, uh, which opens up then to the potential um, of, of you, and, and frankly, beyond you. Um, so thank you, Coco. That was like the most perfect thing you could have done, mm -hmm. of course. And um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Vimla so that she can lead us through uh, the second installment of Ellen Wallace's um, Shamatha Meditation. And, um, 
Thank you. So, um, the beginning of this meditation is going to be similar to what we did yesterday, but, um, you know, relaxing the body and um, the speech, the mental chit chat, and um, settling the body into its natural um, state of relaxation, stillness, and vigilance. So, let me just get a little timer going here. So everyone, get into your meditation posture. Close your eyes. Spine straight. Shoulders back, slight tummy tuck. Bring your focus to this present moment. And begin by letting your awareness descend into your experienced body. Bring the awareness down your torso, towards your legs, to your feet, all the way down to your toes. Feel the gravity as it pulls you down to the ground. And come to rest into these tactile sensations in your body in contact with the earth. Now let your awareness rest in the mode of witnessing, a quiet awareness, not thinking about the body, but just feeling it, just um, imagining the body, tactile sensations. And feel those tactile sensations rising up to meet your awareness. And rest here in what is sometimes called Bear attention. And let your awareness fill the whole space of the body, the entire field of the body, filling with your awareness, like a vapor filling the room. Scan the body. And as you are aware of the immediate sensation of the body, you may find areas of tension, maybe around your neck, your shoulders, your brows. So as you're breathing out, surrender these areas to the breath, surrender them to gravity, and just let go, go of all tension. Relax. Then relax your face. There are 35 muscles in your face and we can tense them all. So relax them, bringing awareness to the face and soften. Soften your expression. Feel the jaw. Relax it further. Feel your mouth, your tongue. Relax them. Relax your cheeks, your forehead, your eyes. Soften the brow. Let there be a spaciousness between the eyebrows. 
And then again, soften the eyes. Let them fall back, melt back into their socket. Relax. This relaxation of the entire face will help to set your whole body at ease. As you do so, it will become easy to remain totally still without any fidgeting. Relaxing the face relaxes the entire body. Mm. And let your body be still, but with a posture of vigilance. Your spine straight, shoulders back, heart open, slightly relaxed tuck of the tummy, and then feel your breath as it goes in and out. Feel the abdomen as it expands and relaxes all the way in and all the way out. Posture of vigilance. And settle the body into its natural state of relaxation, stillness, and vigilance. And on this basis, Settle your speech in effortless silence. Settle that mental chit-chat. Uh, chit chat. We'll do this by focusing on the breath. So bring the focus to the breath. Attend closely. Focus all attention on the breath while at the same time relinquish all control. key is the out breath, so releasing more and more deeply with every breath, utterly release the breath, and along with this release your thoughts, memories and worries, past and future, and rest in the present moment awareness of the breath, enjoy a refuge, a retreat from the ongoing drone of rumination. Now take the breath, the out breath, to the very end. And let this be a time of total trust. Trust that you can totally release the breath, giving it away to the very last scent until there is nothing left. Then without any need to exert yourself after releasing all of your breath, then let the in-breath flow naturally in of its own accord. Received but not taken, be content with what is received. Trust your body, just as the heart pumps within the body, it maintains itself without us. The body is very good at breathing, so just get out of the way. Deepen that relaxation with the in-breath, with the out-breath. And then with the in-breath, Brighten your awareness of the sensations of the field of the body. So relax on the out breath and bring awareness on the in breath. And continue that, deepening with every out breath, relaxing. In breath, bring a clarity awareness to the sensations of your body. Then you'll know 
notice a synergy of settling the body and the breath into their natural state, one deepening the other. Now deliberately allow yourself to put on hold all concerns of future and past. Give yourself a break and allow yourself to rest in that present moment, non-discursively, non-conceptually, focusing on the breath, release any stories of past and future. Be in the present moment, relaxing the out breath and awareing the in breath. For the remainder of the session, focus your attention to the entire space of the body, the entire field, and not just any one part. And turn your attention away from the five senses and ground your awareness, focusing especially on the sensations of the in and out breath as they most distinctly manifest in this field. Relax out. Brighten in, brighten your awareness. This requires a flow of recollection of present moment awareness so that any distractions flow off of you. Maintain a flow of knowing the sensations of the breath. Just monitor the breath. And as we attend to the flow of the breath, ask, how is the mind moving, being stimulated? And let the mind rest in the neutral place of the breath and its present moment awareness. Here we are cultivating attentional balance, which includes ease, stability, and clarity. But for this session, just focus mainly on relaxation, setting the mind at ease. Relax more deeply with every out breath and breathe in a frightening awareness. And even at this early phase, there is an element of balance, relaxing deeply, but balancing lies and sustaining mental acuity and clarity. It's rather like falling asleep lucidly. So just take some time now and focus on the out-breath relaxation, the in-breath awareness. Now and again, just check up on your body, especially the eyes, the muscles around the eyes, and settle your body into its natural state again. And then slowly come back to your body, feeling the seat below you, gravity pulling you down. 
the air and your skin, an awareness of the room around you. And when you're ready, you can slowly open your eyes. Shake out your legs. Are you okay? Yeah. Okay. Now's the time. You're ready for the ride? <laughs> <laughs> so, as I said yesterday, we're including um, Alan Wallace's. Shamatha practice and weaving them with the first Panchen Lama's text on Mahamudra. Um, again, just as a reminder, we're doing so because um, I have found that uh, we really need a very strong foundation of learning how to relax deeply and um, and brighten the mind at the same time. It's, it, it, it sounds super easy, but did you notice? Did you sometimes the more you relax, your mind kind of wants to fall asleep with it, right? Um, but it's about like um, Vimla said, like falling asleep lucidly. And to me, that like really resonates in retreat. Um, that's what you do. It's almost you're always practicing. You don't ever just crash out and go to sleep. It's always practicing. So even in your sleep, it's like okay, how do I best fall asleep? How do I best maintain that acuity as I'm falling asleep so that in my dreams I'm still practicing? And it, 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 it and you do. <laughs> it's super cool. But it takes a lot of effort. Um, just like getting good at meditation takes a lot of effort. Um, but I promise you, um, if you get good at this, it'll save you um, years. It'll save you years in advancement. Um, I believe that. I've been just from my experience. Um, so, so use these, you know, get good at them. I think um, if you're new today, be sure we get your emails because what we've done is we've emailed um, these meditations out to everybody um, so that you can take them home and practice with them. The teachings are on YouTube so that you can uh, listen to them and, and be led again through them. Um, it's important. It's, it's good to get really practiced at these. So the first Panchen Lama, uh, his text is called The Light of Crystal Clarity. And I talked a lot about, a lot yesterday about my relationship with him <laughs> in retreat. Um, I spent the first year and a half uh, very, very uh, deeply going through this text. Uh, going through it line by line, um, asking for blessings if, if I didn't get it. Or actually, I prayed for blessings more when I thought I did get it, because that meant I didn't get it. <laughs> if I think it sounded super easy, I'm like, oh, that, that can't be what he really meant. You know, there's something deeper here. We're always looking for that deeper meaning, what, what's going on here. Um, I mentioned yesterday that two of his main qualities that really resonate with me um, are that he's known as a being a peacemaker and that he's just fearless in everything he does. And don't those two just go straight together? Couldn't you imagine that if in your heart of hearts you are a peacemaker, wouldn't the karma of that be exactly that? Then you know you don't have nothing. To, you don't have nothing. You see, it's the Brooklyn guy coming through again. Um, you don't have anything to fear. <laughs> you don't have anything to fear anymore. It's incredible, this, this uh, upward cycle that he's showing us. And he does it in this text. He says, hey, here are nine schools that are teaching Mahamudra, how to get to that diamond realm of mind. Pick your poison, you know. One of these will work for you. Doesn't matter which one to me. Doesn't matter which school you follow. What matters is that you get there. And what a gift, especially in his time, 
right, where it was all about following one school of thought and transforming everybody to that particular school. He just wasn't going along with that. And, um, and so he's known for that very deeply today. Um, did it, everybody get a reading? Anyone who wasn't here yesterday? Do we have more readings? Okay, yes. I'll read it out loud again. I read it yesterday. Um, we only went over the first stanza yesterday, so if you weren't here, don't don't feel like uh, you missed a whole lot. Um, I don't know what I talked about in that joke. Okay, I'll just read it. Um, don't let any conceptions drag you into hopes or fears within this state of white brain appearances. Go and test the waters of deeper meditation, where there is no movement whatsoever. Just like falling into sleep or losing consciousness, don't try to stop the thoughts which come to mind. Set yourself off at a distance of undistracted awareness. Use the sentry of the mind to catch it running here and there. Then, put in your focus to gaze nakedly upon its true nature, crystal and aware. Whatever mental picture happens to arise, meet it face to face for what it is. Or, be like a blade master, chopping off the head of any conceptual thought that dares to show its face. Then, at the end of the battle, when you are staying still, let go, without relinquishing awareness. Walk it down, then let it loose. This is where to leave the mind. It's incredible, it's exactly like that. If you release this mind of yours, all tangled up in knots, have no doubt, that you will be released. So loosen up, just as it states, without getting distracted. And when you look into the face of any thoughts that come your way, they simply <coughs> vanish by themselves, fading into emptiness. Then, even as you stay there, still, investigate the mind. You'll see its emptiness unveiled, luminous and clear. This is known as mixing and moving with the still. Stop and imagine if it happens to arise. Recognize it as the movement. Stay in its true nature. It's similar to the metaphor of a bird held, held captive on a boat who tries to fly away. It's just like a raven who flies from a boat. Once he circles around in every direction, he'll come back and land on it again. I'm just going to go ahead and uh, address that first stanza again because it's really important. Um, you know, he's saying don't let anything, any of the thoughts, once you sit on your cushion, don't let any distractions pull you here or there to the past, to the future, and to letting the mind control you. See what I mean? It's like where we don't even realize how little control of our, our mind we have until you actually start trying to meditate. You're like, oh my goodness. You know, if, if I had control of this mind of mine, how much more effective could I be in the world? You know, because right now, as most of us are, um, it has us. It has us. You know, so the first thing you have to learn is how to sit back and watch. That's all. So remember in the meditation yesterday, I was like, imagine that you're sitting in a movie theater with those stadium seating, and you sit kind of back in the back of your head, and that's like sitting at the back of that theater. And all you have before you is that big movie screen. And you imagine that every thought that comes is just floating across that screen. It's not you thinking the thought, because that's just a thought too, and that's you being tricked and pulled back in by the mind. 
No, you're the watcher watching these thoughts cross. Okay, as soon as you feel like you're the thinker again, you've been duped. Pull back and just watch. Just watch. Even if it's just your breath, just watch. It's not, you're not sitting there thinking like, I'm watching my breath. No, I'm watching breath cross the screen. And what's happening here, it seems a couple of things really important. One is that you learn to um, distance yourself from those thoughts, from that mind of yours. So all of a sudden when you're like pulled off by some emotion, it's not so much like, I'm an angry person. No, it's like, oh, there's an angry thought crossing that screen right now. Look at that. And what that allows you to do, it gives you just enough distance so that maybe you get a little better at being like, I don't have to hold on to it. I don't have to let it pull me with it, you know? I don't have to think I'm thinking that thought. It could just be another thing crossing the screen. And it's so powerful a tool. Because guess what? When, you start, when we start talking about meeting your mind face to face, what's going to start happening is like you're over there and you're thinking this thought and who you think you are will cross that screen and it'll be just another thing you're watching and it's not you anymore and that distance is getting at emptiness from a whole different direction it's really tricky and it's really powerful so that's why today's class is so difficult because it's all about emptiness and it's all about how there's never anything other, really, than just the present moment. It's a tough thing to bite and to swallow. Uh, so follow me here. Yesterday I pulled out the pen and I made you go through with me, kind of that co classic. What's the pen? I don't even know if I brought it back today. Let me see. I'm going to take you through it again. No, I'm sorry. Um, so here's a pen, right? And I said, What's this? And um, people who <laughs> are willing to play along are like, It's a pen. And I said, Okay, and what happens when a dog comes in? Something totally different to the dog, right? They don't say, Oh, wow, I love this example. I'm going to write to my doggy girlfriend, you know? No, that's not what crosses their mind, you know? It's not. Why? Like, it's a really deep thing. Why? Why do they see something totally different? Why do you not salivate when you see this? You could. You could, you know? I mean, some people like to say, well, I chew on my pens, you know, you know, I don't like that example, I chew on my pens. I'm like, but there it is, you're still calling it a pen. It's still a pen in your head. Why? Why? And that's karma. The why comes from karma, okay? And that's, it. we're going to be talking about that karma emptiness uh, dance today. I'm going to give you a more relevant example than the pen. Let's take relationships. Why, when you meet someone new, are they like so sparkly and shiny, exciting and beautiful? <laughs> Why are they so wonderful at the beginning? And you're like, where has this person been all my life? They're so great, you know? And, um, and that quirky thing she does or he does, oh, I love that even more. You know, I, I don't know, think of a quirky thing. like. Uh, she sings in the shower or something, I don't know. I really love that she sings in the shower. There's a quirky thing about this person who's really great and you really dig that quirky thing. Some time passes, right? And then what do you think? They're not so sparkly, shiny, and beautiful quite the way they were before. And a lot of times we write it off as, well, I'm seeing what they actually really are. You know, now that I've had time, now that I really know the true person, they're not so great, you know. Uh, why? Why? Why were they really, really great? And the person you were waiting for all your life in one moment, and then the next moment they weren't. And you trick yourself and you think, because they've changed. I saw the real person. 
But then what about that quirky thing? What about that quirky thing at the beginning that you really, really dug? Later, it's the thing that just drives you nuts. Why did she have to sing in the shower every time? It really drives me nuts. You know, and it's the thing you loved most about them. That's not them. They're doing the same thing. Something in you changed. Something in you changed. You know, a dear friend of mine just got a tattoo that says, like, you know, be the change you want to see in the world. Well, guess what? It's you that's changing. It's you that's changing in that relationship that's making that person all sparkly shiny to something that's not. Why? It's karma, okay? But the reason they can change is because they're empty. They were never sparkly, shiny, and beautiful from their own side. But we want to fix this story upon them and make them that way. And we think they're never going to change. And we set up all these crazy expectations about how they're going to make us happy. How could anyone live up to that? You know, nothing stays the same. You know, you had the merit to experience something really beautiful, and then you go and you place all these expectations and all you place all this responsibility on this person to be something that they're not. And, um, and you lose that karma. You lose that merit to see them that way. It's not rocket science, people. You know, <laughs> it's not. The question is, is like, how do we get beyond that? That's maybe more the rocket science, you know? Like, how do we stop making that mistake over and over and over? Not just in our relationships, but in everything we do. Um, hmm. So this ties back to trying to stay in that moment and not letting your mind pull you off to the past or present, okay? There's nothing that exists. This is what the first Ancient Lama is telling us here. He's saying, don't waste your time getting distracted by the past or the future. Guess what? It's not even there. It's not even there. You, you have this strong belief about the past and who you are, and how you are, what you are because of the past. And he's like, where is it? Where is this past that was so difficult and molded you into this person that you are now? You know, where is it? It's not here. Any memory that you have of the past is just the present moment ripening of what happened then, and that's just a story. Because guess what? If you ask, I, this happens to me all the time. I'm like, you tell my sister, I'm like, oh, you remember that time when we were little kids and we were doing this or that? And she never remembers, you know? She's just like, <laughs> I, it, it, and she has a whole different story. Because she had a whole different experience, you know? So there's no one past to go back to. <gasps> Even my memory of the past keeps changing, you know? You know, and I think of my mom, you know, she, she, she Sometimes she's like, she gets so deeply affected because she forgets things. And I see that. I've been blessed to be around so many um, mature people recently. And, and they don't have that hold. They're not, they're not holding on to the past anymore because they can't even remember it. Think about what that does to you. A friend of mine has a mom with Alzheimer's, really advanced Alzheimer's. He said that she had had, I can't recall, I think she lost a child or something, and she became very, very um, bitter and, and difficult. So all the kids had a really difficult relationship with their mom. Well, as she's advanced in age, she's gotten Alzheimer's, and she can't remember any of that at all. And now they say she's the most lovely person in the world. Mm. Like, she can't remember that. All she is is this new person every moment. Guess what? That's what you are. That's what you are, too. You're just under the d delusion that you can remember. <laughs> you know, that's just a story, too. There's no one past to remember. And that thing that was so awful in the past sometimes becomes the biggest blessing. Couldn't do that if there was one fixed past, you know. So don't let yourself be drug away and distracted by the past and the future. If you catch yourself like being pulled one way or the other, just recall, what am I actually holding on to? You know, 
there's no future other than this moment and me creating a future that I'll probably just get um, let down because I'm just thinking about this coffee I'm gonna go get and maybe that place is closed or something, I don't know, you know, but it's, um, it's a waste of our time and it's a waste of your uh, time on the cushion. Okay, your time on the cushion is so valuable and it's so rare. That's a karma too. To even be in this class and think that, that you might have something to gain from sitting on a cushion and looking at your mind, I mean, that's just a karma. <laughs> totally. It can go away. Your interest can go away. You've got to nurture it. And that just entails uh, sitting, and sitting daily. You know? And, and it's, it's like I said, it's like yoga. You know, Once you do it daily, it becomes something totally different. Totally different. Everything, even just a warrior one. You thought you knew how to do your warrior one. You don't know how to do warrior one. You know? Not until you know how to do yoga. You know? And, and you know when you know. Right? It's, you just know when you know. And it's the same thing with meditation. You may be just following your breath. But you know when you know. When you're watching. When you're actually watching and not letting your mind be pulled. And you're not thinking my breath. You're just watching breath. So really, if you can take anything away from these classes, just try that. Try to get very, very good being the watcher. Come on, we all like, I love going to the movies. I haven't gone so much since I came out of retreat, actually, which is funny. It's one of my favorite things. So sitting back and just watching that movie screen play. Okay. You've done it. You've done it. So bring back that picture and let it... Um, show itself to you. I wanted to play something for you guys. Okay, so here's what I was thinking. Um, if it's true that there's nothing but the present moment, why is it that things flow so smoothly? Appear to flow smoothly. You know, we really think that there's this flow of time, huh? right? Oh, I talked about time. You all thought I wouldn't go there. Time. Trust me, time is like completely empty of having any nature of itself. Trust me, in three-year retreat, <laughs> when you're sitting on the cushion for 10 hours a day, sometimes it feels like 100 hours a day, and sometimes it feels like two. Why? Why does your day, why does an hour doesn't always feel like an hour? And I want to say, well, that's because I'm having a good time or whatever. No, it's because time doesn't even exist the way you think. Neither does space. You think I walk to that door when I go out and put on my shoes? I do. I really believe that. I believe that I stand up, that there's a fixed door there that I walk through it, and that as I'm walking closer, the picture keeps getting a little bigger and bigger, right? Because it's kind of far, so it's a small little uh, rectangle there, and as I get closer, it gets a little bigger, a little bigger, a little bigger, a little bigger as I get there. Could it be that, that I never move, and that just the picture changes? and the door keeps getting closer and closer and closer and then I'm at the door and then I'm on the other side of the door. Oh, I don't know. Some people say that that's the case. But I was thinking, what's the best way to show that, you know? And I recall these days, um, I was a little kid and I had these um, books that I used to flip through. Mm -hmm. And it looked like they were moving. It was a Mickey Mouse. Mm -hmm. And I loved it so much and it tripped the heck out of me. Because I'm like, how does it do that? Is this still going? Um, how is it that it looks like it's moving? It really looks like that horse is moving. Um, and could it be like your world is like that? 
Could it be just a bunch of still pictures? A bunch of pictures crossing that screen of our mind, making us feel like we're in this constant movement. Like we're in New York, come on, we've got to walk a certain pace, you know? It's like, da -da 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 -da. imagine how fast those pictures are going. <laughs> you know, really fast. Could it be that that's what it is? Could the way the world functions be empty of being fixed in any particular way? Because if it is, then anything's possible. You know? And that's kind of cool. I mean, it's kind of far out, but you have to think about it. It's something good to think about, right? I mean, when I was a kid, I asked that question. It was like, why does that look the way my world looks? There's something there. Maybe I remember having that thought, some little like Mexican girl, like <laughs> living in my poor little town, you know, really watching my Mickey Mouse book and being like, I don't know. I don't know how that's possible. I don't know why that looks like that. We shouldn't lose those curiosities. You know, we shouldn't stop asking those questions. Those are the questions that can change you to the core. Mm. So, if what I say has any veracity whatsoever, um, then who you are is changing moment to moment to moment to moment to moment to. You're not fixed any more than, than any single one of those pictures is fixed. You know, that moving horse thing. You have such a strong story about who you are that it carries through and you pull that along with you. You carry all your baggage with you everywhere you go because you believe in that me so strongly. Like for dear life kind of belief. Like white knuckle kind of belief, trust me. <laughs> In retreat, you, you have to look at that because you want to exist. Because what happens if I don't exist? the way I thought. And that's what you're doing in retreat. That's what three-year retreat's all about, is cutting that notion of the I over and over and over. And, oh, it hurts. Because what happens is you're like up here thinking you're this certain way, this certain person. And you cut it because you think that's what you ought to be doing. And then boom, you fall. And the world kind of falls with you. And all of a sudden, you're like, wait a minute. Not, that's not what I meant to happen. And you start grasping to stop, break the fall. You start grasping to stop the hurting. And guess what? That just makes the hurting hurt more. And then retreat. You're in a space where you can keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it until finally, you, you get hip to the trick and you're like, wait a minute, what's really hurting is me trying to break the fall. That's what's really causing the pain. What happens if I just fall? What happens if I break myself so completely and just let myself fall? Let every notion of who I think I am break. see it in meditation, you do it in meditation, and you feel like you're falling, it feels like some crazy kind of weird free fall, and then you realize there's never a bottom, you never splat, never, in fact what's underneath there is you just start flying, you're like, ah, oh, that's how you fly, you finally let it all go. You start trying to protect this notion of the self. You break it. Stop trying to break the fall, and you fly. And I don't mean like literally like fly. 
I just mean like, like this liberation is born in your heart. Where you're like, wow, anything can happen to me. The worst things in the world that could happen, guess what, they've already happened to me. I've been broken a million ways. It's like having every single bone in your body broken over and over and over and over and over. <laughs> you know? And, and it's, it's, li it's liberation. It's liberation. You know, and I think... There's power in that. So if there's no I, if there's no fixed I, then why am I so worried about karma? Who's the one carrying the karma? Oh, touched on the fingers and touched on that. <laughs> <laughs> Cause and effect still matters. Absolutely. The way the I arises is independence. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it works perfectly. It works perfectly. Just because I know that that door isn't the way out there, the way I think it is, doesn't mean I can't get up and go walk over there. It works. The, the mental images that come into my mind make it possible for me to sit here, get up and walk over there. The fact that there is no fixed I, with a fixed karmic storehouse, makes it possible for me to do a new action, gain a different karma, and have it ripen a different time. Mm -hmm. And the reason that we carry a storehouse with us is because we carry this notion of self and us. Oh, what if you didn't carry that notion? Then you do more of what is called right action as far as like yeah. or as you say, being more in touch with the present. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's deeper. That's good. Good. It's deeper though. It makes it possible to, for radical change. Sure. Right? Yeah. Because you are no longer bound by all the deeds that that person did. Sure. It's a whole new moment. Not just a whole new moment, but a whole new world. Yeah. Because you're not holding to that me anymore. Hard, hard, hard to get to, but so worthwhile. And that's how radical change is possible. That's how seeing emptiness directly is possible. That's how getting to enlightenment is possible. That's why they say the path of the Lama is so powerful. Because this is what happens. It's really cool. When you drop that notion of the self, guess what? You gotta fill it with something. What if you fill it with somebody who's already reached all the goals you're trying to attain? What if all of a sudden you're like, in that critical moment where you're like, oh, you just shattered and you're just like falling <clears throat> apart like into a million pieces, and then <clears throat> arises this being that you've been trying to become with this perfect heart and this perfect sight without the delusions and more driving the way uh, they think the world exists, independent of them. You see that it never was that way. And boom, that's you. That can be you. You know, and then you start carrying that around. <laughs> that's kind of cool, right? That's a better story. There's always going to be a story. Might as well make it a good one. You know? So that's the process. That's the process you're going for. This is what Maha Mudra gets you at. You start watching those mental images as they're coming across that screen. You stop holding them to as I, as my thoughts. You start watching them just cross that mind. So then even your notion of yourself becomes loosened. Just becomes another picture across the screen. And then you start doing in that meditation yesterday, we kind of got in between those pictures. And so I love the way the tankas are set up here because there's like this space between the pictures. It's like, boom, you just set your mind like right between those pictures. No subject, no, no object, no subject state of mind. And you just stick it. And you just learn to stay still there in that place where there's no subject, there's no object, no storehouse, no I, 
you know, and it starts to just loosen all those stories, all those tight, tight, fine, bound, like, like we're, we're, we're totally like ships that have all these like different ropes keeping us to the dock. <coughs> you know, just starts loosening all of those ropes over and over and over and over and over. And then all of a sudden you're, crazy things are possible, you know? You could be sitting, this is, a, <laughs> okay, I'll give you a story. In retreat. I mean, you're alone days on end, right? And, uh, and, and you're, you know, just meditating a lot every day. And um, this cool thing started happening there towards the end where, uh, because I, I believe, that because I had such a loose notion of the self, um, I wasn't always this, you know? I would like look down and I'd be like, oh, that's interesting. It's like wearing a different outfit. <laughs> like you thought you were wearing this outfit and you look in the mirror and you're wearing some totally different outfit. And you're like, cool, all right. I can, I can, I can be in this picture for a little bit. What does that person think like? What does that person feel like? What would they be meditating on? Take me, show me. Yeah, cool, right? Kind of cool. So, and that's possible, you know, because, because it's not so fixed, not the way you think. And it means that if whatever stories you have about yourself, you know, uh, you know, all these, you know, uh, oh, I've done all these bad things in my life, or, or, you know, oh, you know, I have these, like, um, addictions that I did that I'm trying to get over, or I have these, uh, a bad mother who did this thing, or, you know, whatever stories we have about ourselves, they're just stories. Let them go. They're not you. They're not you. You're so much more. You know, and um, and wouldn't it be nice to tap into that, huh? Wouldn't it be nice if everyone could tap into that? So the first pension Lama says there's three ways to get to stillness, which is the platform, right? If you trust me, if you just if you just get to shamatha, your 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 reality starts shifting radically just with shamatha. Just with stillness, and and I, and I don't say just. It, it's a big deal, and it's hard. You have to travel the whole nine stages of meditation, and then you get there, and then it's it's like, oh, you. Well, we'll talk about. It. <laughs> so he gives us three ways, and they're in this um, in the text that I read to you. The first method is you let yourself fall back into deep state of receptive passivity. So it's kind of what Vimala was leading us through and kind of what we did yesterday is that whole idea of sit back, learn to be the watcher, and just let things cross your field. You're not trying to control the thoughts. You're not trying to change the thoughts. All you're trying to do is keep the watcher's state of mind and not let it pull you one way or the other. That's it. Um, the key here is is just that, is relaxation, going deeper. The problem that I came across here was that I, you know, it's like, I want to go deeper, 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 I want to go faster, faster, faster. And uh, it's just a karma too, you can't force it, you know, you can't, you can't force a cookie to taste better in the moment. <laughs> it's going to pick up the cookie you got, you know. <laughs> it's like that with meditation, you're going to get the meditation you want. But, but you do have to work for it. Okay, so it's this really delicate dance of sitting and just like take knowing, recalling what you're supposed to be doing. If you can just recall, all I have to do is be the watcher. That's it. That's it. You'll get it. You'll get there with this one. But he then he gives us another one, right? He gives us the second one is be like a, a master swordsman 
or a blade master any time one of these thoughts dares to show its face. Right? So this is this was me. I was like ninja. I was like meditation ninja. You know, I was like, okay, I know these antidotes. You know, as soon as the mind starts getting a little dull, wah, you know, I'm gonna brighten. <laughs> you know, as soon as the <coughs> mind starts being pulled away, wah, you know, and I'm just gonna like cut it off right away and just set myself straight right away. And you need that. You know, that's a reason it's one of the three. You need to be good at that. What I wasn't good at is letting that go. <laughs> I didn't know how to relax. I really didn't know how to relax. You know, uh, I knew a little bit, but you know, mm, to really go deeply and really get to stillness, you gotta really relax it all and let it all go. Even those thoughts of wishing uh, to go deeper in meditation. You know, you gotta just let all those stories go and let it just ripen for you. So you have to know where you are, you know? Are you the person that still needs to be like the ninja? And blah, you know, just start like fighting those demons off and start um, just to keep your mind straight, you know? Or have you already gone through that and can you just let that practice go? And can you trust yourself to just stay the watcher? Or are you a person who never needed to be a ninja in the first place? Well, could be, you know? It, all of us are different. All of us are different, and that's the beauty of the first punch in line. It's like, hey, dude, like, one of these will work for you. I can't tell you which one, only you can decide. Only you can see. And guess what? It may change day to day. <laughs> that's okay, too, you know? Just know what they are and use them. Um, the third one is, um, the third one um, is a little bit more engaged. Uh, you let the thought come up, but you do a little bit of analysis on what it is, okay? So this is those of you who've been trained in kind of the, the Galupa, like uh, really strong, like analytical meditations. They're beautiful, they're perfect, you need them. Um, there's a way to imagine you're sitting. Someone said really something beautiful to me that yesterday. They said, you know, when we were watching our thoughts go by and we were trying to put our mind at the space, and you said, well, who is that I that's aware? Um, and then I said, you know, like, oh, yeah, I felt that I, like, asserted self. I am the watcher, <laughs> you know. And she said, she, she said that the same thing happened to her. She's like, yeah, when you said that, I just felt that uh, assertion, like just like overcome me. And she said, and I had this uh, inclination to do an analysis on it, to get beyond it. And that's exactly what the first pension mom is telling us to do. That's the third way to do it. It's saying, who's this I that you think is watching? You know, which I are you? Are you the one from yesterday? Oh, how's that possible? Which eye of yesterday are you? You started off sad, then you got happy, then you got sad. Which of, which of those three are you? <laughs> you know? Um, where are you? How do you believe you exist? Well, do whatever analysis you have to do to just cut at the fact that there couldn't be an eye watching in the first place. There's a lot. I mean, I can't, I'm not going to take you through all the different ways to do analysis. There's just no time. But I, I probably have gotten a lot of teachings. If you want to know more about analytical meditation because you think uh, you like it and you don't know how to do it, I'm happy to take you further with it. So the point of all of these three is, is that they're all getting you at emptiness in one way or another. Even when you're just passively watching. Because what that's doing is it's working at you. When I talk about like loosening those ropes to how you think things are working, it means that what's coming in there is some kind of wisdom about maybe it doesn't work the way I thought. Oh, I'm willing to check it out, right? It's worth a shot. What else do I have to do? I've lost everything, <laughs> you know? You know, gotta check it out. Gotta check it out for yourself. You can't take my word for it. Gosh, you know, that won't take you anywhere. 
check it out. You know? And then the one where you're a swordsman, you know, it's it's still getting at emptiness because what's left when you've just slashed everything away? It opens up to like some kind of crystal clarity. Uh, what does he call uh, first Panchanalama calls it uh, the clarity of awareness, um, where emptiness reveals itself to you. Um, and that's what he's talking about. It's like when you just slash everything away, it's like you know, some kind of mist just like dissipates. And then what do you see there? Um, so all three will get you to the goal, is the point. Use any of the three that work for you. Um, and play with them all. You have to, and you have to try for yourself. Um, I'm not gonna give you a break, is that okay? <laughs> you wanna just shake your legs up? Do you need a break? Oh, you totally do. Okay, fine. <laughs> okay, take a take a ten minute break, and then we'll come back. You can take a break. It's okay. <laughs> Yeah, I know. So now, <laughs> <laughs> you got the 